Can you talk about genetics? I mean, we hear a lot about that. If there's a, you know, if your father or mother yes. has heart conditions and we watch you closely, is that, is that fair? Is that accurate? Yes, genetics can have a huge influence on the risk, and we've been doing genetic testing with our patients mm -hmm. for over a decade. One of the ones that we found extremely useful, and it's been available for a long time, is called the APOE mm -hmm. gene. The APOE gene determines to a large degree how you break down what you ingest, what okay. you put in your body. And there are three basic different forms of the APOE gene, two, three, and four, and you can mix and match them because you get one from one parent, one from the other. And just to try and keep it simple, if you inherit the APOE4 gene, you have a lot of difficulty breaking down fats, digesting the fats. So if you're on a higher fat diet, you're probably in trouble. The APOE2s tend to have a little more trouble with the carbohydrates. And alcohol, for example, the APOE2s tend to break that down really well, and it'll usually raise the good a little bit and lower the bad. APOE4s are just the opposite. They tend to have more trouble metabolizing the alcohol. So in a lot of those patients, it will actually increase the bad and decrease the good. So, of course, all the studies show that a little bit of alcohol appears to be beneficial. Mm -hmm. The APOE4s are only 20% of a population as a rule. So 80% are either 2 or 3s, which usually do pretty well mm -hmm. metabolizing the alcohol. So the data always shows, well, yeah, it's a little bit beneficial to drink alcohol. Well, if you're a four, it may not be. It may actually mm -hmm. be harmful. So that's just one simple example of how we utilize that genetic information to guide one of the most important therapies to reduce risk, and that's diet. Mm -hmm. Should you avoid the fats more, the carbohydrates more? Is alcohol beneficial for you or not beneficial? And we always point out with our female patients, even if they're an APOE2, where alcohol, you could argue, well, it could be beneficial. They need to know we've got excellent data now showing that even one alcoholic beverage a day for females significantly increases the risk of cancer. The number one cancer it increases the risk of is breast cancer, then rectal cancer, and then liver cancer. Hmm. So they need to be aware of that. So. And then there are lots of other genes that we look at. One of the ones we've been measuring for quite some time now is called 9P21, and it's nicknamed the heart attack gene. If you inherit that gene from both parents, so you're homozygous for it, you have a 100% increased risk of having a heart attack at a young age and a 75% increased risk of developing an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Wow. So those are individuals that if you know they're homozygous for that gene, you may choose to be a little more aggressive at a younger age, say, mm -hmm. trying to control their cholesterol or making sure they sleep well, mm -hmm. making sure they understand psychosocial issues can drive inflammation in the ar arteries. So they might want to go through some biofeedback if they have trouble with anger or anxiety. You, they certainly need to make sure they get into the dentist on a regular basis and have thorough checkups for oral disease. So those, that type of genetic information can make a difference in aggressiveness of mm -hmm. management, for example. But a large part of the future of medicine certainly is genetics. And we all know people who, wow, they were the picture of health, sure. and they had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people will find out inherited a gene that increases a cholesterol particle called lipoprotein A. And lipoprotein A is an inherited cholesterol problem. Mm -hmm. really has nothing to do with what you eat or how much you exercise. 
And when it's elevated, we have definite data now through genetic studies, it definitely is a cause of heart attacks. And it's found in about a third of the people who have heart attacks when it's measured. It amazes us because you may be aware we started actually guaranteeing our work for heart attack and ischemic stroke several years ago. So that kind of skews our patient population mm -hmm. so that we get a lot of patients now who come to us after they've had their heart attack or their bypass or their stents. So they've seen specialists, they've seen other healthcare providers, and we're amazed at how many of those patients we see and that cholesterol measurement has never been done because you can affect it with certain therapies, one of which is vitamin B3. But if you don't know you have the problem, you're not going to know right. to put the patient on that medication. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the European Cardiovascular Society several years ago came out with a guideline statement saying, look, people need to have lipoprotein A measured, and when it's elevated, they should be placed on niacin. So the Europeans are way ahead of us <laughs> in that regard. Now, in fairness for this country, when that study was published that really unequivocally told us lipoprotein A causes heart attacks, Dr. Michael Lauer, who at the time was the head of the National Institute of Health, did come out with a statement that went out to all healthcare providers. Look, lipoprotein A causes heart attacks. Basically, he was saying, would you please measure it and mm -hmm. maybe do something about it when you find it's elevated? But it's still not in the formal guidelines, mm -hmm. and a lot of people who've already suffered a heart attack, and it also inc increases the risk of stroke, mm -hmm. haven't even had it measured, which is amazing. We have a long way to go with prevention. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, this country's healthcare system really was established on a platform taking care of emergencies, end-stage mm -hmm. disease. And that's led to the bankruptcy of our healthcare system. You know, the Chinese had it right over 4,000 years ago. They actually stated back then that superior healthcare providers prevent disease. Mediocre providers treat disease before it's full-blown. Inferior providers treat the full-blown disease. And our system is set up to reward treating the full-blown disease. Mm -hmm. And we have to migrate over to a platform of preventing disease. Or certainly, at least if you have disease, find out about it before it's full-blown right. and treat it so it doesn't mm -hmm. become full-blown. And that can be done.